Flyers go down last night to the Tampa Bay Lightning. And now joining us on the hotline is the voice of the NHL and NBC and NBC Sports, and that's Mike Doc Emmerich. Doc, it's Zach Gelb here in Philly. Welcome back to the program. How are you? No doubt about it, it definitely is. It's one of the best times of the year, and I love the Stanley Cup playoffs just like you do. And last time you were on with us, you talked about the way you keep up the exuberance in your voice during the games is by eating a few peanut butter sandwiches. During this time of the year, do you eat a few more of those? Well, but there were two the other night in Pittsburgh, and I only needed one of them. But you never know. As soon as you shift gears into the playoffs, you could be there all night, which is part of the joy of the playoffs. You, you can play two, three, four overtimes. Or as the Flyers found out in Pittsburgh, once you can play five. But the good thing is that it's, uh, it, you know, it's like the home stretch of a school year. And I don't suppose there's an analogy that you get grades, but it's the fun part of the year because you can see not only the end, but the end is the most exciting time because it's the biggest prize. And that's why I think all of us like hanging around the rink all year, but particularly now. And the big talk of the town has been the Flyers and the run that Barubi has done with this team, getting them back to the playoffs. But the Frozen Four is also in town. Did you get a chance to catch that Minnesota-North Dakota game last night? No, but I sure heard about it. What a finish, huh? I mean, it just, it's just, they, these kids play all out. It's its fast. It's exhilarating. It's fun to watch. I saw some of the Union Boston College game. I did not see the later game, though. I was uh, preoccupied with hockey by that time, uh, pro hockey. And so as a result, I was not able to see the second game. We're talking to Mike Doc Emmerich, the voice of the NHL and NBC and NBC Sports, getting ready for the Stanley Cup playoffs. And uh, Doc, Barube comes in. He takes over for Peter Laviolette after he was fired. And something has changed with this team. And now they're going to be in the playoff race. What have you noticed that Barube has done differently? Because he's done a really good job with this squad. Well, I think they played much better defensively for one thing. And, and the, the other thing is sometimes you just need a change. For example... When Peter Laviolette was brought on as coach, there were no immediate returns. They were 14th in the conference the day he took over out of 15 teams. And even after two weeks, there was no noticeable improvement. What it takes and what it did that year when they struggled and got in on the final day of the, of the season against the Rangers in that shootout, it, it takes you have to start your program and build with it. And I think that's what Craig did, just like Peter did when he took over. And the Flyers had that magnificent run to six games in the final. These are things that just, it, it takes time for a coach to make his impact and with the players that he has to work with. Uh, even if he was an assistant coach at the time or if he came in from outside, you need time. And Craig had time because it was so early in the season. And gradually his message got in. I thought it was interesting too, Zach, to hear what the likes of Daniel Briere and some of the other former Flyers said the day that Craig Berube was hired. A really good hockey mind. Those were some of the quotes. That was one of the quotes. Uh, they were impressed with him because he'd been an assistant coach at the time that they had played there. And so it wasn't like he was just another guy that would come into the room and talk. Uh, he was a guy that they felt had the capacity to do this head coaching job and do it well. And you need a goalie to win in this league. We've seen teams that have made it to the Stanley Cup finals before, and it's really based off great goalie play. And Mason has been real solid for them in net this year, Doc. Yeah, he sure has. And, you know, there's a, there's a lot to be said for just being patient. And uh, a lot of times that's what it takes. And, and you know, they, they were patient. There were some struggles that he had at one point, not many. And so yeah, the good thing is that they've had Ray Emery as a backup most of the year. He's not been hurt a lot. But this is a year in which most teams have had a lot of injuries. And when you have that happen, you have to count on everybody. And this has been a year also where we've had tremendous backup performances, not necessarily in Philadelphia, but in other cities, where goaltenders have gone like 17-5. and five. I mean, how does that happen? Well, it's just a year when the main goaltenders have needed the extra work. Part of it has to, has to be with the Olympics and the fact that you had that gap some guys got that time off. The better players did not. And so all of this kind of fits together into having some chaos in your lineup from injury. Uh, the Flyers are fortunate now in that they have one player suspended and then, and then one in, in, well, Bourdon, of course, uh, has been out a good share of the year. But also Ponger is still listed as an injury, and, and that's, that's sad indeed. You think of what this team could be if they had someone like that on their defense. 
You mentioned the Olympics. Claude Giroux has been a completely different player ever since the Olympics, and he was snubbed from Team Canada. Do you at all think that light a little bit fire under his belt and really get him going down the stretch? These guys are thoroughbred sack, and if all of a sudden you start to tell somebody they can't do something, uh, yeah, that's exactly what I think happened. That said, Claude's one of the premier players in the entire league without that kind of motivation, so it doesn't surprise me he's playing well. But you give somebody a spark and say, okay, you say I can't do it, give me a chance. And, and of course, he's got all the chances in the world for Philadelphia because he's the guy. And uh, and you see the result. I mean, he's got to wind up in the top five in scoring. And he's going to be a, a prominent player for them in the playoffs, and he's shown that before. It's one of those things where here we sit on Friday late morning and we're still wondering who they're going to play. And we don't know. No doubt about it, as we're talking to Mike Doc Emmerich from NBC and NBC Sports. And also Simmons, he's been real special this year, having a great season, putting the puck in the net and making some big passes. And he's been really good in front of the net, like he has been his whole career. And when it comes time to the playoff, you got to have those tough, gritty players. He's definitely one of them. How valuable is an asset of Wayne Simmons to an hockey club? Well, he's one of the premier power play guys in the entire league. Now, we're, we're, we've gone back a little bit, haven't we, to the point of uh, he's a throwback to Paul Holmgren and to Gary Dornhofer. And, you know, we have to go back, and, and it's been a while since we've seen a lot of teams use the strategy of stationing a big man at the front. I mean, the Dano Chara last time I checked had 10 power play goals. It wasn't because he fires from the point. It's because he stands in front of the goaltender. You not only need to be big, but you also have to have quick reflexes and and as he showed in the goal that he scored in Philadelphia, it was a marvelous goal. Uh, to just walk out and, and backhand like that was pretty impressive. But uh, I think that, that that's the one thing that Wayne has, has brought to the Flyers, but also has brought to the league. I mean, this is a prominent player in the league largely because of what he can do at the front of the net. It's a tough place to go, and I know all of the Flyers color commentators back through history have always talked about how no one wants to go there, but there's a good living to be earned at the front of the net. He's proved that. If the season was to end today and there's still two games left up against uh, the Pittsburgh Penguins game that you'll do this weekend on NBC, and then the Flyers wrap it up the next day up against Carolina, right now the Flyers would be playing the Rangers, and we know that the Flyers have struggled at Madison Square Garden in their last eight games. They're 0-8 and being outscored 31-9. to Why do you think the Flyers have such problems, though, in the world's most famous arena? You know, I don't know, and I'm not sure the coaching staff can tell you. It's not because of last change, that's for sure, because most coaches are clever enough to get the guys out that they want to get out at some point during the... uh, There may be a mental block there, and the question is, do those mental blocks, if in fact they open at the Garden on Wednesday or Thursday, do those mental blocks carry through? There is a lot to be said for the 48 to 72 hours that follow the end of the regular season, because a lot of demons can vanish. A lot of them can remain, and that is the uncertainty that all of us who don't play face as we watch the opening face-off for a game. Will the demons of the garden continue, or will they be able to just because it's, everything's O and O, and there's nothing, nothing really to save it for, just go out and all of a sudden steal one of the first two games in New York, and then all of a sudden the series switches? Don't know, but it's... I used to work uh, NFL games with a guy named Hank Stram, legendary coach from the uh, Kansas City Chiefs, and and he used to say that's why they screw on their helmets and blow up the footballs, just to see how how a game is going to be. That's why they play them, and and so we we wait in anticipation of them starting, and the only thing that we have to work with over that 72 hours is history, and history is, is... fun unless you're a flyers fan history is fun but by the same token it means nothing as soon as they drop the puck it means nothing you look at the rangers the big story with them was that what happened at the deadline when they swapped captain for captain and sent callahan down south and up north came marty san louis san louis really hasn't been able to put the puck in the back of the net for the blue shirts but he's been putting a lot of assists out there he's been hot lately yeah no no he sure has and uh, you know, this is this is uh, usually a trade. Uh, winds up working for both teams, some to a greater extent than others, but it winds up working for both teams. And I think this one has. I mean, Callahan's been a, a force for Tampa Bay, and I think they needed that kind of player. And San Luis, it was one of those inevitable departures that was going to take place that they helped him do. 
And even though, you know, the goal total has been anemic, at least he's been productive. And, and all the highlights I seem to see when he's on the ice, he's setting up somebody else for a beautiful goal. Um, will they be able to sustain that? You know one thing, that Lundqvist will be fine and that Mason will be fine. There's nothing in their track records that would suggest that they collapse at playoff time when the regular season is over. The question is how the teams will perform, and we can do nothing to provide an answer. But we can pretend like we can provide an answer for 72 hours, but we can't. Zach Gelb here with you, WHIP Radio in Philadelphia, talking to the great Mike Doc Emmerich. And Doc, uh, I've filled many calls about this throughout the week, and it has been that the Pittsburgh Penguins would be a better matchup for the Flyers. They, those two teams go at it this weekend. And the Flyers, they play really well up against the Penguins. They've had their number this year. What makes the Flyers so good when they go up against one of the best teams in the league in the Pittsburgh Penguins? Oh, you know what? I think I saw the last time they played here last month, Zach, was that the Penguins tried to become physical against the Flyers. Um, you, you don't do that. I mean, that's that's just not the way that you win against them. The Penguins have to assess their strengths, which are their skill level, and also drawing penalties from the opposition, not going out and hammering. I understand the frustration when you continually lose at home to a team. But the way to solve it is to not go out of character. The way to solve it is to do what you do best. The Flyers are the hammering team. Uh, the Penguins are not. But the last game that we saw in Pittsburgh when, yet again, they lost to the Flyers, it was that. Um, they probably are. They probably wouldn't want to play the Flyers, especially the first two games at home. But no player will ever admit that to you. I have a feeling that the team they'd like to play is Columbus. But they won't admit that to you either. We'll just have to see how it sorts out. This could wind up being, you know, the Flyers could eventually wind up going to Boston if things fell the wrong way or the right way for them. So hard to know, but fun to think about. Are you a fan of the new format with the playoffs and the whole realignment? Here's the thing. The, the one time, and this goes back a couple decades in history, the one time that you used to have really fierce competitive first and second rounds was when you played within the division. And we remember that. And Flyer fans also remember that was the curse of trying to win the division title, sometimes the conference title, and the Rangers were rolling along in fourth place. And then they would come in at the first round and the Rangers would eliminate the Flyers a couple of times. The fierceness of the division contributes to a good, fierce, energetic game in the playoffs. But sometimes you have those things that blow right up in your face. And Flyers fans of the early and mid-80s will remember those times because they seemed to happen a lot when the division was played. But as a neutral observer, I like fierce playoffs. I think that's why people that don't normally watch a lot of hockey in the wintertime will watch a lot of hockey in the playoffs because it's quite a gladiatorial contest. Not necessarily the fighting, but just the stamina that it takes to play every other day and then you play hard for two weeks and maybe you get to go on for another two and another two and finally at the end of eight weeks you don't have much left but you got enough left to lift a trophy if you win it we all know the stanley cup playoffs are the best playoffs in sports in my opinion and i look out east i see boston they've been dominant all year long you got a chance to see them going up against the flyers last weekend and i like boston to get back to the stanley cup finals but let's take a minute to look out west if you had to label one of the teams the favorite out west to get back to the cup who would it be boy it's a pick but uh you know as you look at these teams out west that have over 100 points they've almost all suffered down the stretch here i think what happens too is that you can't match the hunger of the teams you're trying to play against in the last couple of weeks because they're desperate they got to get points out of this and you don't have to have them you have the luxury of declaring guys hurt whether they are or not you have the luxury of declaring guys hurt not playing them so they can be rested for the test that's ahead that we were talking about the last eight weeks if you're good but Colorado's the team that's impressed me the most in the last three weeks. Now, they don't have Matt Duchesne. Will this evaporate in the 72 hours from the end of their season into the first round against Chicago, if it winds up being that or somebody? Because they're not destined to finish second yet. They might actually finish first in the division. Um, so that, that could be real interesting. But I think Colorado's been the most impressive team. There are five teams out there that have 100 points, and the Kings could have 100 by the end of the weekend. Um, but I, I like Colorado right now, but I don't like anybody out west that much. And I think I agree with you, Zach. I think the overwhelming favorite to take it all is Boston. 
On the way out here with Doc Emmerich, while we have you here, you've done a bunch of uh, Devils games throughout your time in this industry. I'm sure you saw Marty's comments yesterday calling uh, the Flyers saying that they've been content with 500. Has the philosophy of that organization changed? Is there something to Marty's comments? No, I don't think the philosophy of the organization has changed, but the success rate has. Uh, This was a team that only missed the playoffs a couple of times in a quarter century, and now they've missed it three of the last four years. So there's probably a despondency from not being at the big party uh, that they have been accustomed to over recent years. Now, I don't think they do things any differently because the man in charge doesn't change things. Lou Lamorello is the guy in charge, and, and the way they go about doing business, which has worked so well for them in the past, has gone on fallow times now, and it's, it's directly related, I think, to a couple of things. Number one, uh, they lost the idea, the, the notion of keeping Zach Freezy. And in my opinion, the reason they could not keep Zach was that he realized some heavy money was going to Ilya Kovalchuk. By the way, where is he? Oh, that's right. He's gone, too. So when you have those two players who contributed so much for you in goal scoring in the regular season, big numbers, and in shootouts, and the last I checked, they hadn't won a shootout all year. Well, let me look. Yeah, 0-12. Uh, those are valuable points, and those are the points that are the difference right now. If they were only 500 in shootouts, they'd be in. I think those are the things. Uh, I don't know philosophically there's any different way of doing business in New Jersey than there ever has been. And one of the toughest parts is replacing a legend. We've seen it with the Yankees. Uh, Jeter, this is his final year. Mariano went out at the end of uh, last season. And you have Martin Brodeur. He's been so special to the league and especially the New Jersey Devils. And he's on his way out in New Jersey. How tough is it to end on a good note with Marty? Yeah, with Marty, you never know. And for that reason, I'll say, unless he announced his retirement this morning, I don't know that he's done, and I can't say for sure that he's done in New Jersey. That'll just have to play itself out. So I don't concur that the story is over with him yet. I have a hard time imagining him ever hanging up his suit for the last time. Well, Doc, we appreciate a few minutes today. Thanks so much. Enjoy the games this weekend and the rest of the Stanley Cup playoffs, and we'll talk to you again real soon. Okay. So long. Mike Doc Emmerich right there from NBC and NBC Sports. We'll take a quick break here on the main event on WHIP Radio in Philadelphia, and we'll be back right after these short messages. 